everybody. Um, I thought that was an excellent presentation by Andy, and you're probably going to hear the phrase, as Andy said, quite a lot in, in, in the next half an hour. Um, but what I will try and do is apply uh, some of the sort of general principles and themes that he's identified and explain how I actually sort of work with companies on the ground to uh, sort of wrestle with the problems that he's correctly identified. Um, so this is me. Uh, I, I am a local person. In fact, we moved as a family to St Albans because my dad took a job with Hawker Sidley, which had been to Haviland, which this campus is named after, then became British Aerospace, then, then was closed. This, where we are now, used to be part of, of Hawker Sidley. Uh, I think my, my dad had the desk just, just there. Um, the other stuff you can see, I'm a long-suffering Saint supporter with Nigel. Uh, I, play, you know, I play badminton 100 yards away from here. And uh, further down, you see my sort of uh, professional background, which has included uh, for a number of years in Paris and Geneva. But I've been back here for some time. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these point, uh, point by point, so don't worry. Uh, a lot of it has been covered off already, um, but I, I thought I would just quickly highlight one or two things, uh, perhaps to add to what, what Andy already said. So if, if perhaps we look towards the bottom half there of the, of the slide, um, as we've seen, it's, you, know, you, you could say that the, the industry started in 2010 from a very low base, has grown very fast. It's still growing substantially in absolute terms, but percentage terms is just easing off, but, but still fast growth. Um, there have been, I'm aware of two IPOs in America, and he mentioned on deck, and more or less at the same time, one called Lending Club was also uh, brought to the stock market in America. This was about December 2014. So Lending Club is the largest uh, in America. It was valued around five or $5 billion at issue. It quickly went to eight or $9 billion. It's now fallen to about three. So the stock market valuation of Lending Club is around three, three and a bit billion dollars. Substantial figure though. Um, interestingly, its operating business has continued to grow since it came to the stock market, but its share prices has fallen away. So either it was heavily overvalued at the time of flotation, or it's undervalued now, or somewhere in between, or maybe it's still, still overvalued and it will fall further. Um, but you know, those are substantial sums to be achieving for a platform itself, that is what, which is what Lending Club is. And, I, and um, on deck, I think, has a valuation of around <coughs> $500 million. Um, it's worth saying a little bit about regulators because uh, they don't get much of a sympathetic hearing. So I will say that you know, I, I feel for them. And they, they're in a tricky position because um, uh, the government uh, and everybody sees small businesses as the motor of growth for the economy. So they generate jobs, they're innovative, they're flexible, but they need support, including funding support. And uh, crowdfunding, whether on the equity or the lending side, is a way of doing that. On the other hand, the regulator uh, sees it, its role is to protect private individuals, retail investors, uh, from the unscrupulous shenanigans of financiers. So they've got a job to protect investors uh, but at the same time, what investors want to do is what the government wants them to do, which is to, to support small businesses. And uh, you know, so they have to wrestle with that conundrum. And in a way, it, you know, legislation moves more, more slowly than technology involves. And um, so the industry ha has not been through a recession. Uh, 2010 funding circle kicked off. As Andy said, Zopa started in 2005. That is really, and that is a, a true peer-to-peer, person-to-person lending, not to businesses. So that's been going for 10 years. That is really the only uh, company of its sort that has been through a recession. And so since 2010, the economy has picked up. It's over the worst of 2008-9. So the, 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 the crowdfunding, if I use that as a general term, or the alternative funding market, hasn't been through a true, uh, a true recession. It'd be interesting to see with the pressures that are building up uh, how that how that plays out, and uh, you know certainly on part of the equity side, young companies uh, that have only been received funding in the last year or two, statistically at the best of times, a number of them fall by the wayside. And if we were into a, into a more severe 
recession at some point, then, then, then you know, those, those companies will be tested. And on the, on the lending side, you, you, the figure to watch is default rates amongst lending platforms. Uh, I guess it's reassuring for the audience that I also cited the same uh, source as Andy, which is pushing boundaries. Um, the, the Nesta Cambridge Judge uh, Business School report, it's an annual publication. Um, this came out uh, in February, maybe you were at the launch as well then, uh, the launch yeah. event, yes. Yeah, so, yeah. so see, we, we were both there. Uh, but it is a very good, authoritative, comprehensive piece of work, so it's a good reference point for anybody who's interested here. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on this. Um, we've, we've already seen the, the circumstances around bank lending, but I put this up really to show that, uh, I, you know, I, I, certainly myself and I hope other people in, in sort of alternative funding are not anti-bank per se. You know, on the contrary, uh, banks are subject to, to very real pressures and a few years ago, at the height of the recession, uh, everybody blamed banks for reckless lending. Reckless lending got us into this problem, and now the banks have been castigated for not lending enough. So they've tightened up their lending criteria, they're more circumspect, and they're being blamed for not lending enough. Um, and they do have greater problems around technical issues to do with uh, BAL 3, the Bank for International Settlements, capital adequacy ratios. They have to allocate more capital than they used to for every loan that they make. And unsecured lending, SME lending, it is particularly capital heavy for banks in their lending processes. So I do have some understanding of that. Uh, and perhaps where banks do let themselves down a bit is more on the service side because you do hear a lot of complaints about banks that, that are very slow to make a decision or first of all they will say yes and then months later they come back and they say oh, actually the credit committee has said no. So there is more they can do around the service issues but there are general, genuine constraints on um, uh, around capital adequacy issues here. So um, government has tried one or two initiatives, uh, but they haven't achieved a great deal other than inadvertently to push up house prices, arguably, the way the money's been channeled. Um, so corporations have long ago disintermediated and they issue bonds directly, uh, gilts 2% on 10 years. Why wouldn't you borrow if you're a major corporation? And, and the fact that interest rates are so low uh, is an attraction for um, big borrowers and it's also a problem for savers, which is again part of the driving of the alternative lending market as a vehicle for savers and investors to achieve higher yield. Everybody is on the search for higher yield. Um, so um, I don't think I need to, I'm not going to go through all of these. Um, there's, there's lots of sources of information around um, alternatives for companies. Uh, for example, the British Business Bank, in conjunction with the Institute for Accountants and of, the, of England and Wales, uh, has got a guide to, the, uh, to business finance. There's, they, they list lots of alternatives for companies at different stages. Um, but I just put it, I like the quote at the bottom, um, everyone needs banking, no one needs banks. It's attributed to Bill Gates. Uh, and you know, we have seen uh, a disintermediation of corporate lending through bonds. Uh, a lot of foreign exchanges move away from banks to specialist companies uh, and peer-to-peer uh, -peer lending is taking away some, some, is eating into the lending market further for banks. So banks need to uh, think how they use uh, the services they offer. Uh, they are a bit constrained actually from a technology point of view because they have a lot of old systems and then they bolt them onto even older systems and they try to bolt new systems onto old systems so they have a, uh, they have a lot of technology problems in making it all work. They have a lot of regulatory problems. They've been subject to enormous fines uh, you know, and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so I work on the ground and, I, and I, this will be the next slide with a number of companies in this area. Collectively, uh, this is what they do. So collectively, the companies that I work with are looking for companies that are looking for funding of £100,000 to £10 million. And that can be uh, debt, that can be equity. Uh, and equity subdivides into senior, uh, sorry, debt subdivides into senior loans and, and mezzanine loans, which is loans with an with a equity kicker or a warrant or option, some form of equity play attached to them, uh, or a combination. Pr pretty much any sector in the UK uh, most stages that differentiates, I'll, I'll show in the next slide. Uh, due diligence is, uh, is a topical subject and an important subject. And so 
you know, the, the equity crowd funders like Crowdcube and uh, Cedars don't conduct thorough due diligence in terms of the underlying quality of the investment. They, they will conduct due diligence to verify that a company exists, the directors are who, who they say they are, information that's available from company's house. Uh, they will help them with their pitches, but they, they don't provide substantive, what I would consider to be substantive due diligence. Uh, and it's very hard to for their model. Uh, first of all, with a startup company or a very early stage company or pre-revenue, it's very hard to do meaningful due diligence. Uh, and secondly, if you're only investing, you know, uh, you're, you're raising £100,000 under CDIS, um, again, you know, for, the, for the money that you're going to make, even if you make 5% on £100,000 as your arrangement fee, or 7%, uh, you know, it doesn't justify substantive efforts on due diligence. Uh, so their business is built around volume. Um, that is less so for, for Syndicate Room, which has a nuanced uh, approach to that. Uh, founding ventures, which is more involved in due diligence. So uh, who does how much due diligence is, is an interesting point here. Uh, and on the lending side, um, as we've seen, funding circle, you know, average loan size is £60,000. So it is an auth automotive, automated lending process. Again, that isn't true across all of the lending platforms. Um, Yes, so a variety of investors, which um, I'll come on to on the next slide. And for, for private investors on the equity side, EIS, that's the Enterprise Investment Scheme, is definitely a consideration. Uh, in a nutshell, for companies that qualify under the Enterprise Investment Scheme, uh, invest, private investors receive 30% offset against their income tax. So if they invest 100, they give 100 to the company, they get a certificate, they show it to the in revenue, and they get 30 pence back in the pound, or 30% offset against their income tax. Uh, and uh, also, if they keep their investment for three years, and it will be a very illiquid investment, and, and they won't be able to choose when they exit, but if they keep it for more than three years and it exits at a profit, any profit is exempt from capital gains tax. So those are attractive um, inducements, if that's the right word. Uh, for people to consider investing in small businesses. And they are there for, re they've, that, that actually, EIS has existed in some shape or form for more than 20 years, it goes back to the uh, BIS scheme in the early 90s, and uh, it survived through changes, successive changes of governments. So government considers, or has considered to date, that small businesses need supporting, but uh, if I invest in, in Tesco, it's liquid, I've heard of it, it's big, if I invest in Widget & Co, they're small, I've never heard of them, I'm not a customer, and it's very liquid. So to balance that, uh, in my consideration as a small investor, EIS comes, uh, comes attached. Um, so these are actual companies that I work with, and they are all broadly in alternative funding, but they are nuanced in terms of, of what they do. So. Um, the first of those is, is looking for companies that are established. This is not start-up. Uh, this is companies, and, and the people involved in this come very much from private equity background, and they, make sub they do substantive due diligence. They have made about, in, in just under four years, they've made 35 investments and raised around 150 million pounds. So typical deal for for them would be around 5 million, of which 4 million would probably be equity and 1 million would be loan notes. And this is very much aimed at high net worth investors. Um, actually, one thing I should have said here, which I think was on the previous slide, in all of these cases, they are not funds. So everybody has the opportunity to invest in any given situation that's presented to them. No one has the obligation. Although uh, the, the first two do, do run managed services for people who, who want to sort of portfolio that the company is selecting for them. Um, uh, the next one, uh, Money & Co, is a very small version of Funding Circle, if you like. Uh, it's a P2P lending platform that was started two years ago. Uh, their average loan size is £310,000, so it's, it's larger than, than Funding Circle, and they do have a small team of physical human bank analysts, people who work in credit at, or came worked in credit at major banks and now work for Money & Co. So they do have a, a tech and human approach to, uh, to deal sourcing and analysis. And that's a straight senior debt 
offering. Um, <clears throat> so, but I want to, the, the point here, uh, investors, uh, so investors in P2P, uh, as Andy said, is very much evolving because the concept of crowdfunding implies that the crowd, the man on the Clapham omnibus, the man in the high street, lends his £10 or £20 or £50 or invest it into, a, into a, a, a platform or via a platform into an equity or a loan situation. And, and that is the case. Um, and in absolute terms, the crowd as an investor is growing, but in percentage terms, it's very much falling away. Uh, and high net worths, high net worth individual investors and family offices uh, have come into this, uh, this area. And, and, and on the lending side, though much less so on the, on the early stage equity side, but on the lending side, institutions, as we've heard, are coming in in, in a big way. And you know, so institutions, and all of these people are driven by the search for yield. Yield, but where the efforts have been made to mitigate risk. So lending propositions, uh, and you know, these in this market, you will probably get mid to high single figures as your, as your return. So if you're a pension fund that has got, wants to match long-term liabilities with long-term revenue, you know, 2% on 10-year guilds is not that attractive but for regulatory reasons, uh, they are obliged to buy a lot of gilts, uh, so they are beginning to dip their toe into the P2P market. And um, uh, so they are spreading out, they're spreading out tranches of investment into a number of platforms. And as it, Andy rightly says, company, uh, institutions aren't just assessing the individual loan, op uh, a loan on offer, they are assessing the platform itself, so Money & Co, presents due diligence, has due diligence discussions and a pack with, their, with, with institutions that are considering putting liquidity onto its platform. Um, and to pick up on a couple of other things that, that, that Andy mentioned, Money & Co is looking at the innovative finance ISA. Uh, it's something that it would like to be involved in because that will be a stimulus to the crowd becoming more involved. Um, it's, it's an ISA uh, that so at the moment you're familiar with the cash ISAs and stocks and shares ISAs. This is an ISA that will allow people to invest their annual allowance into a lending platform and have access to a portfolio of, of loans through the platform that they choose. It will be regulated. Everybody's a, a lot of the platforms applying for regulation. FCA is a little bit overwhelmed in processing those at the moment. Um, and, and Money & Co is also looking at other sectors like, in fact, uh, supporting uh, house builders in, in the way that uh, we've heard um, and that means that there's cash issues around that. You know, at the moment, Money & Co is an auction site. Uh, another question is, should it remain so? eBay used to be an auction site, uh, but now most of what you buy on eBay, you buy on a fixed price. Uh, so, because people just seem to like the certainty of saying, that's the price, I'll buy it, rather than I'll get into an auction and, and I'll bid this and I'll bid that and I'll see how it goes. Even though you know, they may or may not get a better rate for themselves as a consequence. Um, there's another issue around institutions coming on, which is uh, they may, they may not, but they may want whole loans. So they may say, I will come on, I will put 10 million pounds onto your platform, but I want all of a loan. And that presents an issue for a company that presents itself as a crowd lending company. And all of these companies, well, n not Rockpool, but, uh, but Money & Co, and all, all the ones in the, in the smaller, if you like, si scale of, of, of investment, present themselves as crowdfunding, friendly to the crowd, they want to welcome the man on the high street. If you then start to say, ah, oh, but uh, actually this institution, you can have all of that loan, all of that loan, all of that loan. You don't want this one, okay, we'll offer this to the crowd. Then that presents a conflict of interest in effect. And, and it's, you know, there are, there are issues around reputation and, uh, you know, you, you can see the issues that are at stake here. So, uh, but if the institution says, well, we want it all, then does the, will the platform have the strength of character to say, well, in that case, don't come on our platform because they're turning away a lot of liquidity if they do that. Um, and the, the final one I work for is, um, is it does the things that Rockpool doesn't do. Very much a, a technology play. And, and whereas Rockpool is, is about private equity professionals providing money to companies across a range of sectors and then being on the board, but not being industry specialists, more monitoring. Um, Stuter is all about rolling their sleeves up, getting involved. They have a small number of companies and well, they work very intensely with those companies. Um, 
So on a more local nature, uh, all, uh, all of these companies, most of these companies are London-based, uh, but, but it's important to be, out, to be out and about. So I spend quite a lot of my time doing all of the, these things in Hertfordshire and indeed doing them in other parts of the country as well. Um, I would like to give a special mention of dispatches to Growth Hub because I didn't know he's going to be here today, but we have Martin Carr from the Hertfordshire Growth Hub, very good source of, uh, of knowledge and information for, for companies in, in Hertfordshire. Um, uh, and interestingly, so I'll just say a word about LEPS because LEPS, have, local enterprise partnerships, have been charged with, um, they receive funds from central government, they receive funds from Europe. There's a program called the Jeremy Program. LEPS bid to receive funds uh, and then they are a me mechanism for allocating, for distributing funds to, to companies in their region. Um, LEPS boards are made up of local councillors and local businessmen that they often don't have the, the infrastructure themselves to administer uh, funds which they may divide into equity funds, lo loan funds or outright grants. So they will put that out to tender and, and ask specialist fund managers to say would you manage this tranche which is the debt side or this tranche which is the equity side within our, within our region. Um, British Business Bank is actually getting involved in this now. Uh, because, there, for example, uh, there is a nor Northern Powerhouse, is the phrase of the moment, there is a Northern Powerhouse Investment Fund, which has, and the British Business Bank has forced a number of LEPs in the northwest to combine its fund, which is around £400 million in total. And the British Business Bank is now overseeing the distribution of, uh, and the allocation of that. They're about to start a tendering process for fund managers who want to manage tranches of funds in the northwest, and, and this tender process is just about to go live. So the previous slide was called Finding Companies. Uh, this slide is called Finding Funding. So everybody is looking for, all the, all the platforms are looking for businesses to invest in on the equity side or to lend to, and they're looking for funding, which may be the crowd, maybe wealthy individuals, maybe institutions. And um, so, again, I spend quite a bit of my time uh, talking to people uh, up and down the country in all of these areas, including, including here in Hertfordshire. We engage with the LEP here. Uh, local authority pension funds is an interesting one um, that we're looking to engage with as well. And uh, uh, professional advisors, accountants, lawyers and the like, are a big source of companies uh, because they've got corporate clients that want to borrow. And they're also a source of investors because they, they look after or they advise on the tax positions of individuals, they advise on estate planning, succession issues, uh, and so they are good people for companies that I work with in the round to be, uh, to be engaging with. So this is actual stuff that uh, we've done in Hertfordshire. Um, so the St. Albans and, and Harpenden Chamber of Commerce is, uh, is a very uh, active one actually. And um, there's a Hertfordshire chamber, but there's a local St. Albans and, and Harpenden chamber. And uh, that when I say main speaker, that, that wasn't me, but um, the, the, the founder of Money & Co is a lady called Nicola Horlick. She's quite a well-known sort of business uh, fund manager. And uh, so I, I, I uh, chamber asked if I could get her to come and speak, which I did. And the same thing for the Hertfordshire IOD breakfast event, similar size event. Uh, uh, that was last year. Uh, Biz for Biz is a local business organisation for CEOs. Um, I've organised a number of specialist uh, sort of general private lunches for investors uh, myself in, in, in Hertfordshire, especially in St Albans. Um, and of course, last but certainly not least, here I am at the University of Hertfordshire. So these are all things uh, that, that, that are doing in Hertfordshire and the companies I work with are doing all of these and, and, and to be honest we're doing them in other parts of the country too. But it is important to be proactive in terms of engaging with companies up and down the country. Oh, Univers University of Hertfordshire also uh, in other parts of the country we've involved, uh, uh, we've got engaged with the Goldman Sachs 10,000 programme particularly in Birmingham out, out of the University of Aston there. And I thought I would finish Finish is probably a word that you, you're looking forward to hearing um, by giving uh, two specific examples of companies locally that uh, have been supported 
through, through the, the companies that I work with. So this is a, this is a local company, uh, topical, given that uh, what I said about uh, aviation here in, in Hatfield. Uh, and it uh, repairs and refurbishes light aircraft engines. It's, uh, it's under its current owner for seven years. It's been going for a number of years before he took over. It's a uh, you know, two million pound turnover, a profitable company, got a nice distributed uh, set of clients and um, skilled, small but skilled uh, staff, uh, but em employee base. And you can see there, so those were the, that was the loan amount. Now the interest rate is a blended interest rate because it's an auction. And so people bid at different levels. The bids get accepted from the bottom up. So if you bid to lend at 20%, uh, you, you probably won't get in. If you bid to lend at 8%, you probably will get in. Uh, there is a grading system, which I haven't gone into here. Uh, within Money & Co, they, they offer a, uh, grades at different, uh, they, they attribute different credit ratings, but they, they only yield suggested rates, not uh, firm rates. Also, at the moment, the crowd is still deciding. I say at the moment because it may, you know, one thing under consideration is, do we go for term loans with fixed, with fixed interest rates? At the moment, they're amortizing. So that means that each month, rather like an amortizing mortgage, capital is repaid back along, alongside the loan. Now, uh, that is both good and bad from an investor point of view because it means you're getting back some of your capital all the time. So if you, if you, if you make a five-year loan and it happens to, um, you know, the company goes bankrupt after four years, you've still got most of your capital back. Um, but it does mean that if you are a systematic investor, into lots of these, you're always getting money back and you've got what's called a reinvestment problem. So that means uh, I've got this attractive loan at 8%, another one here at 7.5%, percent i built up my portfolio, and then each month I'm getting money back. If I don't want to suffer from what's called cash drag, I need to be reinvesting all the time. Some of these platforms have automatic re-lend re programs which is designed to achieve that. If you're doing it on your own, uh, you either want a term loan where you know what you're getting the whole time or you need to be actively looking for new lending opportunities. Um, and finally, this, this one was done through, or is being done, will be done through Rockwell. This is a, so um, crematorium. Uh, this is actually a new build, so it's really construction finance, but it's being provided in the form of uh, EIS eligible equity. The, the game plan is to uh, find a site, I think that's under negotiation, a site, uh, one year to build the facility, uh, two years to run it, and then the exit in this case will be via a refinancing, uh, bank, bank refinancing. And um, this is with a management team that has done this several times before. So it's a new site, it's a startup in the sense that it's new here, but it's a new site for a company or for a management team that has done this several times before. Uh, I am conscious of time, so that has been a little bit of a whistle-stop tour, but I hope it's helpful, I hope it's nicely complemented all the information and the scene setting and the issues that Andy raised uh, uh, by sort of putting them into context of, of the way platforms are acting on the ground and the way we work indeed locally. So thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions?